Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be back here in Grand Hall. I'm a Queen's grad twice over, computer science and math, and my MBA a long time ago. And uh, I have actually been here at Queen's for almost 20 years. And uh, it's really interesting to actually talk about this whole topic, having been here for 20 years, because when I was at Queen's and when I joined Queen's, you would be hard pressed to actually find anyone who thought they wanted to be an entrepreneur. So fast forward to 2015, and it's a whole different ball game. So what I'd like to do today is talk about three topics using 15 slides in 20 minutes. Um, and we have a lot of ground to cover, but if I was sitting in your shoes, I would be interested in maybe three things. So why is it that it's fashionable to be an entrepreneur again? Uh, not that it wasn't always the case, but it has been a while. Um, why should you care? You're here in a commerce program, you're in your first year, uh, who knows what you'll end up doing. But what I'd really like to talk about is the fact that it has never been easier, nor has there ever been a better time to go for it. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of history about how we come to where we are in 2015. I'm going to talk about historically what has created issues for entrepreneurs. 20 years ago, we didn't even have a course on new ventures in the business school. And now we have several, we're adding a whole bunch, um, mostly because, as I said, there has never been a better time. And then I'm going to end up just talking about what I like to call the era of the frictionless startup and really look at why it is so easy to go down this path these days. All right, so first up, a little bit of a history lesson. So first of all, what do we mean by an entrepreneur? In an age of Wikipedia and Google, if you Google entrepreneur, I don't know, you could get a bazillion hits, um, or even more. I'm not even sure if a bazillion is actually a word. Um, but you see a number of very famous economists, Lester Thoreau, for example, who actually uh, had a definition. You see the Wikipedia definition. Uh, and you see pictures of all kinds of interesting entrepreneurs. How many of you recognize every one of those pictures? How many of you recognize one of those pictures? Let me guess, it's Elon Musk, right? <laughs> of Tesla and SpaceX fame. Well, to the right of Elon Musk is Kimball Musk, who's a BCom grad from Queens, and I've been around Queens for long enough to have actually taught him. Very interesting story. So 20 years ago, you could tell that those two, in the early days of the internet, they were going to go for it. Anybody recognize the two pictures in the middle? Anybody from Calgary? OK, Brett Wilson, noted Canadian entrepreneur, to the right of Brett is? Another Queens grad, Michelle Romano, engineering business, so the latest dragon on the dragon's den. Um, she and a couple of her uh, classmates, when she was here at Queen's in their undergrad days, started to whet their appetites for being entrepreneurs and uh, worked on a business that ultimately they didn't pursue called Evandale Caviar, farmed caviar. So any of you who've ever bought any farmed smoked salmon, this was doing for, smoked sa doing for caviar what uh, they did for smoked salmon. Now, it never worked out, but boy, did they ever learn a lot about what to do and what not to do. So much so that their next business, um, which was incubated in Bytopia.ca, called Snap Saves, was actually acquired by Groupon several years ago. So Michelle and her two co-founders are busy earning um, their way out of that business, uh, full of ideas for the next. The two women you see on either side of that slide, I would encourage you uh, to look them up. You've got a founder of a really cool company called 23andMe, which is a company that, where you take a swab of uh, saliva from your cheek, you send it in, and they sequence your DNA, all for $99. And on the right, you have a very controversial entrepreneur who's created a company called Theranos. How many of you have heard of Theranos? OK. So uh, taking a bit of slack from the, or a bit of flack, I should say, from the FDA at the moment. Um, but many examples of uh, very different types of businesses, some very close to home, and, and some people who are, are world-class and well-known. So that's what it means to be an entrepreneur, to actually take something 
new idea, some creative thought, and actually derive some commercial viability out of it. So, a little bit of history before we go too much further. I've always been fascinated by 2015, being an entrepreneur is really hot. Um, and many would argue that there is an entirely new class of business person that we call entrepreneurs. Um, who remembers Bill Gates? I say that jokingly. I'm sure you're talking about that in some of your courses. So uh, Bill Gates was an example of an entrepreneur in the tech space who really started at the, the very thin edge of the wedge, if you will. But when Bill Gates actually started Microsoft, it was not cool to be an entrepreneur. And this is how not accepted it was. Gates is a well-known golfer. I'm sure there are a few golfers in the room here. And uh, you know, as soon as he hit billionaire status, he thought, I must be completely legit. I must be so legit, I'm gonna see if I can get a membership at the Augusta National Golf Course. Traditionally, only corporate titans or politicians actually got accepted into the golf course. Do any of you remember the story that they turned him down? I'm pretty sure they would accept him today, along with the Elon Musks of the world. It's so different now um, to be an entrepreneur. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. The latest issue of Vanity Fair has is is got Mark Zuckerberg on the cover, and all of the up-and-coming wealthiest people in the world, they are all recent entrepreneurs. But we've always had entrepreneurs in history. Um, and one of the things that I always regret when I was a student was not spending more time actually looking at the history of things. So you could argue that the original traders in the Silk Route were the original entrepreneurs, and they have been around for a long period of time. And what you see on the little in infographic on the right-hand side here, and I put the reference down, if you're interested in this area, there's a great website called um, Funders and Founders. It's always got interesting statistics. Um, but, you know, we started from hunters, um, we moved through the era of the Industrial Revolution where big companies mattered a lot, and they still do matter, obviously. But now, in the last 20 years, you've seen this massive movement towards legitimacy as an entrepreneur and as a startup founder. Now, a little bit more history, and then we're going to dive into... Um, you know, what has created issues for startups historically, and where are we at this moment in time? So three converging trends here, if we think about how we find ourselves here in 2015. So Richard Cantillon, I'm sure none of you have ever heard of him. He was the guy who actually coined the term entrepreneur. And this was in the early 1700s in France. And he was a noted economist and started a whole new school of thought. They were called the physiocrats. And basically their view was at one extreme, government should not interfere at all. We should not be taxed. Those of you who are diehard ultra conservatives on the fiscal end of things, you would really like this guy. Because he said no intervention, no nothing. Um, th actually, the term entrepreneur is derived from the French word for entreprendre, which is to undertake. So he started the whole thing off. Um, now, fast forward a little bit to 1775, and you have Adam Smith, who I hope you have heard of in your economics course. And Adam Smith was really the modern father, if you will, of capitalism. And his point was that Picking up on Cantillon's work, his point was that self-interest and the ability to actually move forward and create great new things was the way to generate economic wealth and social good uh, over many, many years. So that started to really take off as a form of business that allowed individuals to actually go for it. And the very last piece to the economics puzzle, and I know this is not an economics class, is a very influential guy by the name of Joseph Schumpeter. And you may hear in many of your courses the term creative destruction. And Schumpeter was the one who coined that phrase. And he was the one to really start to study entrepreneurs and how they changed industries. And again, in 2015, you know, think about whether or not there is actually an industry at the moment that is not undergoing dramatic transformation because of some of the technological trends that we'll talk about. 
So you have all of this history of thought that makes it possible. You've got capitalism, you've got people studying entrepreneurs, you've got the term out there, that's all well and good. You also have, in parallel, this tremendous movement forward in money. And you will read many books while you're students. One of my favorite books of all time was written by Neil Ferguson, and it's called The Ascent of Money. And it's the history of finance. If any of you are interested in finance, it is a phenomenal read. But without the evolution of money, so to speak, all of this entrepreneurial thinking and thought wouldn't have been very possible. So we go from the bartering system way back when to a system of using tokens, then you have coins, you have Marco Polo who introduces paper money for the first time, and now again you fast forward to 2015, you've got companies like Square, you've got Apple Pay. I mean the whole finance industry, the whole payment industry is under flux. You've got Bitcoin, you know, who knows whether or not that's ever going to take off. I can't even wrap my head around how that actually works. And then the third converging trend is that ideas are everywhere. You do not have to be a king to have an idea. You do not have to be a religious figure to have an idea. You do not have to be some corporate elite to have an idea. Anyone can have an idea, but it wasn't always thus. All right, so with a little bit of history and some converging trends, we find ourselves in 2015. So what's happening now that didn't happen before to also give rise to this tremendous opportunity? So when I was here at Queen's in the mid 80s, first of all, nobody ever talked about being an entrepreneur. You know, you would be an entrepreneur if you couldn't get a job. Um, public opinion was not in favor. You know, I always visualize going to my parents, you know, my fourth year saying, you know what, I don't think I'm gonna look for a job. I'm gonna start my own business. That would have not gone over well. I'm going to show you results of a study in just a moment where that whole mindset is shifting. You had many barriers to finding ideas. You did not have the internet. You had magazines, people traveled, people chatted, but it was much more difficult to actually get an angle on anything that was really cool. One of the websites that I go to all the time is springwise.com. Unfortunately, you have to subscribe now, but it used to be available for free. But what they do is they post ideas from around the world, from a global network of trend spotters. You wouldn't believe the cool stuff that's out there. So I get an email every day, you know. So today's three new businesses that were worth um, paying attention to is a company in France that has a vending kiosk that spits out short stories to encourage people to read. You have, not that you guys will uh, like this one, but there's a, a business, um, not going to get the name, it's called Software Secure. It uses facial recognition software to proctor online exams using the camera on your computer. So, and this, I know, many of you are going, darn, or maybe not. Um, but what's really interesting is the facial recognition software, big data, all this pattern recognition, they can tell when students are getting stressed okay, or not paying attention, or I don't know what else. Um, but to just give you an idea, there's so much interesting stuff out there. So finding ideas is really easy. Um, finding talent is really easy. So you don't have to come to a great place like Queens and the Smith School of Business to meet people who you might work with. There are other ways of finding talent. Finding money is really easy. You used to have to beg at a bank or no a venture capitalist, and now you've got things like Kickstarter and a whole bunch of other things. Even building corporate infrastructure is a lot easier. You have to used to raise a lot of money to do that, um, and now there are many other options. So things are changing in a big way in terms of actually being able to build your business, but things are also changing in a big way in terms of attitudes towards entrepreneurship. What you see on the left-hand slide here, uh, left-hand side of the slide here, is a study that was done by Intuit, which was started by a great entrepreneur by the name of Scott Cook. So he commissioned a study with Ipsos Reid to actually look at the millennial generation, your generation, and their attitu attitudes towards startups. Um, again, you can Google and get the infographic. I'm not going to read all of the statistics, but I'd just like to point out that your generation is twice as likely to start a business as the average Canadian. 
78% want to become entrepreneurs so that they can control their own destiny. Very few where it's all about the money, and that's a very good thing. Um, because the barriers to actually creating a business are so low, many uh, of your generation will do it from home, your parents' home. All you need is a computer and a fast internet hookup, and you're in business. Public attitudes are also changing, and what you see on the uh, top right-hand corner is some statistics about how um, entrepreneurship is a good career choice uh, has been changing quite dramatically, especially in Canada. As they always say, there are no U.S. statistics because they didn't participate in this particular study. And on the bottom right, again, from founders and funders, is showing that you actually don't need that much money to get a business started. There is a myth that's, that people believe that you need, you know, half a million bucks or 20 million bucks. I'm assuming you guys are familiar with Airbnb. Yes? Okay. You know, second perhaps only to Uber in the new sharing economy. $20,000 is what that business got started with. So you don't need a big whack of cash is really what the slide at the bottom is all about. Some of the other businesses, Under Armour, et cetera, started with relatively little as well. So some of those public opinion barriers are going away rapidly and the understanding and belief about what's possible. Now I wanted to just talk a little bit about ideas. I've already given you my tip about springwise.com with a few little keystrokes uh, you can get the 12 hottest technologies that are disrupting every industry. So we have lived recently through the era of uh, the internet. Prior to that, it was the era of the personal computer that drove a lot of entrepreneurial activity. And now what you see on this chart, we've got the internet of things, we've got 3D printing, we've got big data, we've got massive computing power, we have mobile internet, we've got cloud computing, and this is only one small slice of the possibilities. I could have put another chart up here with all of the interesting things in medical technology. And one of the points that I'd like to leave you with is that if you're, if you're even remotely interested in this area, whether as an investor or a co-founder or a founder, what you need to think about doing is just turn your own radar screen on. Start to pay attention. Find some time. My story about Michelle Romano, Anatoly Melnichuk, and Ryan Marion is one where they met once a week over a beer to just kick ideas around. And it's a very interesting story about how they landed on farmed caviar. They were talking about farming exotic woods. Anatoly is from Russia. He said, if we're going to farm anything, why don't we farm sturgeon? A quick little Google search looking at the huge supply, demand imbalance, and voila, is born the idea. But if you're not actually trying to do it, it's highly unlikely that anything is going to happen. Okay, now here's the last point that I wanted to cover. And the last piece to why we see so much activity in this area. It is easy to get money, okay? You can do it on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. There is a huge movement on peer-to-peer -peer lending. So the Lending Club, the original company that started peer-to-peer -peer lending was in the UK called Zopa.com. This is taking off like a rocket. I have seen five business plans in the last month on peer-to-peer -peer lending companies or consulting companies to help people prepare for peer-to-peer -peer lending. So again, if you're interested in the finance area, this is taking off like crazy. You don't actually have to have a storefront. You can just set your business up on Shopify, which is a bona fide, amazing Canadian success story in Ottawa. Again, a humble entrepreneur who thought, wow, you know, a lot of people could probably benefit from this. So again, like a credit card and a fast internet pipe and boom, you're in business. You know, you don't have to buy servers to run your infrastructure. You can just contract with Amazon Web Services. You know, bingo, 15 minutes, and you're up and running with server capacity to do whatever. You want to go global? Alibaba, no problem. One of the most interesting businesses of late, um, and uh, I don't have the name, but I have the logo, is called Upwork. It used to be called Odesk. So you need access to talent. Let's say you got the great idea, but you don't know anything about search engine optimization. No problem. Upwork is a network of freelancers around the world 
who post their skills, they post their hourly rate, and they connect people who have certain skills with uh, people who have skills that they don't have. So you take away the barrier of finding talent to do these things. And um, the last one is in the upper left-hand corner here. And uh, it's a cool little company actually started by Jack Dorsey, whose picture was on the second slide, who is also the CEO of Twitter. But his first gig was Square. This little device that plugs into your cell phone so that you are immediately able to take credit card payments. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to take credit card payments before, but you almost have to sign in blood to get a unit from a bank and have a credit history of six months of cash flow before they'll give it to you. So that barrier, gone. This is the great democratization of the startup era. And you guys are right in the middle of it. So every reason why it used to be difficult, every barrier is just being taken down one by one. Okay, last couple of things that uh, I'd like to point out here, in addition to it being so easy to do this, is that, you know, the modern corporation, as we think of it, is actually experiencing some challenges. There's a great article in The Economist on October the 24th talking about the reinvention of the corporation and really talking about some of the challenges um, with ownership, with big funds owning blocks, um, with uh, management being disassociated from the owners, so on and so, fo so, on and so forth. Um, so money fleeing from the public markets into the private markets and into private equity. You've got Michael Dell who's taken his public company private so that he can actually run it the way he wants to. You have actually got many of the biggest market cap companies in the world who are staying private for as long as possible um, because the advantages of being such um, are pretty astronomical. So I'll leave you with a couple of final comments about uh, what potentially is in it for you. And I could stand here for the rest of the day showing you charts that look just like this. I think Uber's has an even uh, steeper curve. Um, but you look at Airbnb, all of this information is available, by the way, for free online. You get onto Wikipedia, you Google any of, any of these companies, you can get the growth charts, you can get the data, you can see all of the series of funding. They started, it's not showing on the slide here, they started with $20,000 um, and have raised multiple rounds of financing and uh, now we know uh, the rest is history. Over the summer months this year, Airbnb had 17 million guests go through their service. So I actually think some of these predictions are a little bit off and a little bit low. Um, and they started in 2006. The idea launched in 2008, and it's seven years. So this is kind of interesting, um, but this is really interesting. And there's a lot of lingo and language in the whole world of startups, and you hear about gazelles, and you hear the latest is a unicorn. So when you look at the right-hand side of this chart here, and the stuff in green are consumer companies, and the stuff in gray um, are business-to-business -business companies, but you've got Facebook at the extreme right, and I would draw your attention to the recent valuations, and Facebook, $122 billion. Um, and lots of other companies that you would be familiar with, LinkedIn, Dropbox, GoPro, you name it. Um, so it obviously can be done. And this slide is trying to make another point, which is not only can you get pretty big, but you get pretty big pretty quickly. And this is my point about the unique moment in time. And these extraordinary valuations and creation of companies like Google, for example, and Dropbox, Dropbox and Facebook have taken advantage of the internet. And that was really just the third wave of what many people would argue is the third wave of 10 waves that are changing absolutely everything. All right, this is my last slide for you. I said three topics, 15 slides, 20 minutes. Um, while you're here, try it out. If you've ever thought about starting up your own business or working for a startup, you got four years while you're here. So see if you really wanna do it. Meet people, kick around ideas, um, 
Go to uh, www.queensinnovation.ca, which is the innovation connector that will actually give you all of the conferences, the activities, the summer program we have with engineering. Um, it's not for everyone, um, but it's not as hard as you think. Um, and being a graduate of, the, graduate of the commerce program at the Smith School of Business will put you in awesome shape to actually be part of those enormous success statistics. So thank you very much. I hope to see you around the, uh, the halls and goods. I love uh, everything entrepreneurial. Um, I'm on the website. I'm in the dean's office. Uh, come see me if uh, you're cooking something up as we speak. So thank you very much.